Welcome to Breakaway, the minor hockey podcast brought to you by the OMHA. I'm your host, Aaron Wilper, founder of the Coaches Site. And as always, I'm joined by Ian Taylor, executive director of the OMHA. Ian, great to see you, man. How you doing? Great, Aaron. Merry Christmas. Almost Merry New Christmas. Year when we're doing this. Yeah. Yeah, this is I, this is a pretty special time in the the I think the overall sports calendar, but specifically the hockey calendar. What um, what do you look forward to from a sporting lens at this time of year? English Premier League just started up too. I saw. Uh, yeah, they started back on uh, uh, this week as well. Um, so I do I I do like that. Um, obviously, World Juniors are are back in play. I'm I. I I actually really enjoy watching the Spengler Cup. Um, uh, yeah, I, I think that's a great, um, you know, that's a great tournament, a great history. Um, the club teams, Canada puts a compilation team players playing in the American Hockey League, right, and and, and European pros. Um, so I and it's a phenomenal, you know, setting playing there in Davos. So I do really, yeah. I do really enjoy that. Um, I I. Uh, as I was telling you earlier, you know, getting getting uh, outside, been able to skate outside a few times, so that's that's huge on my, uh, you know, my ODR list. You know, get out there and uh, yeah, and, uh, and and skate outside. So I, lo- I love that, and uh, uh, yeah, yeah, it's all good. There's 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 no shortage of things. That's for sure. Yeah, it's um, it's it's kind of I feel like um, it's kind of this this week. Um, and it just happens to be like a, a, a weekend, a weekend, um, this right. year with Christmas and new year. Right. But it's kind of like that part of the, the, the year where time just sort of stands t- still, <laughs> yeah. I feel like. And it's just like, there's the reality. Yeah, you don't know what day you it is. Day. Yeah. You, it's not a Tuesday. It's, oh, it's a Canada, Czechoslovakia day, or it's, you know, <laughs> a Spangler right. cup. It's Canada versus uh, Sparta Prague. Day. <laughs> exactly. Um, so it's, uh, but yeah, it's been, um, it, it's very exciting. And I'd be curious to know, are, are you, are you the, are you, you know, at new year's, are you the guy that's like, I'm, I'm turning over a new leaf. I'm changing some habits. I'm getting rid of some bad habits. Like, do, or is it just, does it just one year melt into the next? Uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, I guess I, I wish I could say that, but I'd be lying to you. Yeah, no, I'm not much of that guy at all. <laughs> are you? You're lucky. You know what? So my my wife a couple of years ago, and I, there's a name for it. It's I think it's called the whole thirty. So it's like thirty days without um, uh, adult adult cocktails, uh, no bread, yeah. like basically anything that's good about life. We don't we don't partake in that in uh, the month of January. So I'm um, but I'm taking um, our mutual pal Matt Rhodes uh, as as a kind of a thank you Christmas present on on the first uh down to seattle and the seahawks play at one o'clock oh, really? and the crack and play at five o'clock so we're gonna catch both games and um and i'm sure that'll be kind of my last day of doing some fun stuff before my wife takes control of me for the next 30 and um that's so awesome that's, that's the game plan that no, that's that's good. that's brilliant now you know you know that's when and again i might be dating myself i don't know you know because people work out at at home Impossible. now and they have apps and all that sort of stuff. But, uh, it used to be, you know, this was, um, you know, resolution time of year was they sell the most, yes. uh, gym memberships for in January. Right. Because, because that was, yeah, that was that's, all, those that, that's all part of it. Too. That's, yeah. That's part of it. That's also, uh, that goes part and parcel with this uh, whole 30 thing. It also includes, you got to go to the gym lots and it's, it's, yeah, it's, um, so I'm getting myself psyched up as we speak just to get ready for this. The, there's the, Very good. You know, the, uh, intrinsic drive and discipline that's going to be required, <laughs> but we've done, you know what, funny enough, we've done it the last, this will be year three or maybe year four, but it's at, at the end of the day, at the end of January, you feel like a million bucks, you know, like, why don't I just do this? Yeah, exactly. Time, exactly. Um, yeah. So, well, isn't, isn't that the goal? What, isn't that the goal? Isn't it? Uh, what is it? Twenty-one days to change a habit or make a new habit, something like that. Yes. So yeah, yeah. So that it's, that would fit yeah, right in there. I haven't quite been able to piece it together for a full <laughs> year, but maybe maybe twenty twenty three is the year where nice. um, I just uh, yeah I really lean in. So, but I'll tell you what. Um, speaking of New Year, I know uh, I'd be curious to know in the OMHA world. Yeah, 
where what is sort of this time of year represent like what's going on um as a as an association and are you are you already looking ahead to like championships are you oh, past yeah. that from a, oh where's, yeah, yeah where's your where's your focus yeah no for sure it is um I, you know i think what's interesting is you know christmas time is still or, or you know in that the kind of christmas holiday time frame is still is still um uh, a fairly big time for tournaments but i I, I, I think um, I think there's less probably less than in the past though I think I think people are so busy um, I, I think we're seeing a slight reduction where people want some family time back and a little bit of break in their hockey calendar before getting yeah. back to it so so that's interesting because it used to be you know again with my two guys growing up it used to be, uh, first it was every, it was every Christmas. We, we were in some kind of tournament home or away. And then, and then it became kind of an every other year sort of thing. So I, I do see a change there. Um, and I think in, in how families want to use their time. Um, but I also, um, also again, our, our, our seasonal calendar has changed that, that, um, you know, we're not going to be just into, January and looking at at playoffs starting, which which was again yeah. one, of, one of the negatives of our of our season, and and certainly one of the positives of the new, um, uh, you know, of us adopting the player pathways and and a seasonal calendar, which sees everybody playing meaningful hockey at, at least to March. So 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 I, I I think that's another good part. Like you know, we'll start back up um, after New Year's and uh, still still have a fairly good runway of 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 regular season yeah. play. You know what I mean? So, and it, you know, when you explain it to people, they go, well, what, well, what do you mean? You were the regular season ends the first or second week of January. It makes no sense. And it doesn't, it doesn't. So we've, we've remedied that. Um, you know, we're, we're still a cup just a couple of years into it. Right. But, but I, I can tell you just mindset wise, it just makes so much more sense. And, and I think we're not jamming so much hockey, um, into everyone's calendar, quite honestly. Well, so I, I want to get to our guest in a, in a sec, but yeah. I, I just want to comment on what you just talked about the calendar. I was thinking about this yeah. um, after one of our previous conversations. Like when I coached junior hockey, yeah. you you would see, so you bring in your young players and they got to learn the rope. So from kind of, you know, training camp to, sure. to Christmas and usually December rolls around and, 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 you know, players are just, they, they're excited to get home and see yeah. their house. And all Dog that. days. Yep. But the sure. biggest improvement you would see in players. And I mean, I mean, your son, uh, Brandon would, you know, coaches in the OHL and I'd be curious to know what his opinion is on this. The improvement you see, like from, from when the players return from Christmas to playoffs, like that's when those young players take off. And yep. I was just thinking about that when you talked about the calendar, like this is prime, um, development time in the hockey calendar at least from my experience for young players the fact that you've you afford that opportunity it's one thing to get ready as a team but it's also i think as an individual player this is a great opportunity for them to you know really you know put all the pieces together that they've acquired um in that first half of the season totally and and even even having a little bit of a break being raring to come back you know what i mean being hungry to come back uh, I, I think that's huge um uh, you know, the idea that there's no rookies anymore, right? As you say, like they, they you got that ahead, yeah. you know, pre-Christmas. And, uh, and yeah, no question. Uh, Brennan always says to me, Taylor boys are second half players. So there you go. We need a little more. Sure. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> um, and, and so Ian, just, I guess, transition to today's guest. Yeah. When I say Ray Ferrero, what comes to mind? Oh man, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I, I gotta be careful when we bring them on because I am a little starstruck. I'll be honest with you. Like, like, you know, one, just a big deal. Like he's a big deal. Um, you know, I, I, I know it gets thrown around a lot, but best analyst in the game and, and, uh, hundred um, percent is. Yeah. And, 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 and also, you know, and again, you know, he's traditionally been tied to the world juniors, right? He's not, he's not doing it this year. And, uh, but, but he's also a guy, you know, you know, and, and when you talk about, um, the way the game's played now versus the way it used to be old school, new school, someone who totally appreciates. And obviously, I mean, he, 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 he scored, you know, he scored at every level, incredible, incredible rate in the Western hockey league, right? Like still holds the record out there. And, sure does. but, but, 
but just just an appreciation of of skill an appreciation of of just getting of getting better and and um you know he's the first guy and you know we'll, we'll talk with him about it but he's the first guy to say you know stuff kids can do today is is you know just just so much more than what when he played in the league right and uh um, so, so, I mean, wrap that all up together, Aaron. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled he's joining us. This is, uh, this is huge. Yeah, no, I'm excited. And, and you know what? I, I first got to know Ray. So I coached in trail, uh, in the BCHL years ago where he's yeah. from and, and yeah. got, to, got introduced to him. And then, um, a few years after that, I coached in Cal Cigar, which is just a community just down the road and, and coached his older boy, uh, Matt, who was a goaltender and, um, and, and was just always, um, really appreciative as how he dealt with me as a young coach, given, you know, his background in, in the sport. And, but I think what comes to me is a, just he's, you know, he, I think the reason his, his, his opinion carries so much weight is because he's like, he wants to get it right. He doesn't just throw things out there. He wants to do the mm. research. He's curious. He wants to get all the information uh, and make sure that, you know, his, his opinion is something that he can back up. And, um, which I think is not always the case in today's media where we're looking for hot takes and yeah. quick sound bites that go viral. Um, and, and I think the other aspect too, is just somebody that has seen the game literally from all levels. He's been, you know, um, you know, a player, he's been a parent, you know, the broadcaster, I mean, he's really, you know, from the world juniors to the world championships to the NHL, right. um, you know, he's, he's seen it through, through every, I think possible lens. And so I think that really just adds a, a lot of layers and, and, um, to, to how, how he views the game. And, and I think just importantly where he see, sees it, it going. So, um, this will be a really, like I said, Ray's spoken at our conference a handful of times, um, some of our most popular presentations and videos. And I think just has a, a really keen insight just on, I think for the uh, purpose of this conversation, minor hockey yeah. and how we kind of create an optimal experience for, for young players, both from a developmental side, but also just from a, you know, enjoying the game and, and becoming um, and having a great experience that's going to impact them for the rest of their life. So, um, and for anybody that's, that's not familiar with Ray, a uh, couple um, quick statistics here. So uh, Ray played over 1200 games, in the national hockey league with the New York Islanders, the Los Angeles Kings, the New York Rangers, St. Louis blues and Atlanta thrashers. Um, you know, Ian, you mentioned uh, still holds, the goal scoring record in the Western Hockey League with 108 goals, 108. 72 games yep. with the 108, uh, the Brandon Crazy. Kings. I got to think that that one's never, nobody's going to touch that one. That's no. remarkable. And uh, since retiring uh, has been, I, I think most hockey fans, um, he's been a part of your Christmas holidays uh, through his coverage with the World Juniors. But as mentioned, um, you know, he's been involved with the NHL broadcast, uh, World Hockey Championships. Um, he's, he's, um, you know, I, I feel like he's, his voice is kind of, uh, been a fixture in our, in, if you're Canadian anyways, in, in your living room. So really excited yeah. to chat with Ray and we will be right back with him after the break. The Coaches Site is a proud partner of the OMHA, along with many of the top development organizations in the world. The Coaches Site was created to provide hockey's top coaches, leaders, and performance experts with a platform to share their experience and insights with amateur coaches and minor hockey organizations with the goal of enhancing the development opportunity for all players. A membership includes access to 500 hours of educational videos, a library of over 700 drills, articles breaking down the latest tactics and systems, and our newly released initiation skills series, which provides a video-based development curriculum for the first three years of a player's minor hockey career. Regardless of the level you coach, the Coaches Site is going to provide you the ultimate coaching toolkit. Listeners of the Breakaway Podcast can save 25% off an annual membership by using the code OMHA when they register. Again, use the code OMHA and get registered today. Ray, good to see you. Thanks for joining us. Merry Christmas. Hope everything's good. It, it is. It is. Well, we, Ian and I were just talking this this week uh, between Christmas and New Year's. I don't know if there's a better week of sports uh, in the calendar, which, I mean, you, you're probably more familiar than anybody, with, uh, especially as it relates to hockey. When when was the first year you did the World Juniors? Uh, 2012 in Calgary and Edmonton. And I was uh, terrified. 
Really? What was oh, yeah. terrifying? I didn't know any of the players. I, yeah. you know, I got, I, I had no, um, no touch points on how to do a tournament. I'd never, I'd never done a tournament. I had, you know, I had done by that time about nine years or so of NHL games, but you go in, you do one game, you move on to the next one, you do another game. And, um, you know, now I'm doing two games a day, um, with, at the start, 40 strangers. I mean, I'm, you know, like I'm doing a, a Finland Slovakia game. Like, a lot, what of, are the a lot of consonants. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, <laughs> and I got to tell you, and I mean this, like, there's lots of, we poke lots of fun at it during, you know, on Twitter and stuff. But Gord is like, Gord Miller is just been an amazing partner for all those years for me because he would literally walk me through each name. No and kidding. he's, he's trying to do his own prep. And now, so we'd go through like, for example, the, once you learn the rule of the language, the, the letters as they appear on the paper make sense to you. Like oh, there's no God. way I see is it's except <laughs> it is. Right. And so in the game, as you're trying to do it free flow and not look down each time the player makes a pass to go, who the heck is that? The first tournament, the first couple of days, I was, I, I didn't sleep. I was like, these these names were rattling around in my head, just like, you know, because I wanted to get it right. And yeah. the, the once you get into the tournament, you know, the, like you get into a little bit of a flow. But man, that that first week was I was underwater big time. Well. In terms of the on ice product, when you look at you know 2012 and uh, you know up until last year or this past summer when you wrapped up, how has the game evolved? And and that's a pretty small sample size, but I it seems like the game has has come a long way, or at least it's it, it looks different than, than well, it, did 10 years it ago. does, Aaron, for sure. But but I'll, I'll before I get to the the meat of the answer, like you know in that first tournament, Mika Zabanajad was playing. Like, it's not like the guys that we're playing aren't very good. So, yeah. like, to say, like, the game continues to get better and better and better, it does skill-wise for sure, but it's not like the guys 10, 12 years ago were around, or, you know, were getting around in rubber boots. Like, they they sure. could play. And yeah. so the, the difference in the game, I think, is it's become more, um, uh, more skill-based, less physical-based. Uh, it opens the door for guys that aren't quite as strong. Um, you know, certainly from my day, I mean, you, you know, I was, you would go to the front of the net and the defensemen were 220 pounds. Like, right. like I, I will, you won't hear me in a broadcast say, Oh, a guy's got to go to the tough area because every time I think of the tough area, I think of Darian Hatcher and Scott <laughs> Stevens and guys that would, you know, pick you up and pitch you in the corner and there were no penalties and that's se. a different sport yeah when you yeah. yeah that was a different i look at some of the old time games that come on and i'm like there's five penalties a shift and yeah. i'm not saying it's better that was just the way it is but when i look at the players now they can do things on the ice at a speed that players prior just couldn't so where somebody might have tried a toe drag before it would have been done at a much slower pace uh, yeah. picture, picture Mike Madonna, you know, one of the greatest skaters ever to play. Like he could skate in this era and you wouldn't even notice him out there. Like he'd look the same as everybody mm -hmm. else. But I remember him making moves. Like he would drag it into his feet, and pull it out on the other side on his back end. Like I would never been able to do that. Certainly not at the speed he was. So that stuff has changed. Uh, defense into the offense has changed. Uh, that, that used to be a rarity. Now it's a requirement. Um, penalty killing has become way more aggressive. And they mm. they had a chunk of years where they just totally dominated the power plays. Now what's happening is there's five start points for the power play. Nobody's in the same place other than Ovi for more yeah. than five seconds. So the penalty killers now are constantly having to search and find and react to where these players are on the ice. You might you know, one of my favorite players right now is Tage Thompson. You might picture Tage Thompson scoring from the top of the left circle all the time, 
But there's lots of times he's in the bumper spot, like he'll move or move up on the top. If you're trying to deny that one timer, you have to find, you got to find him first. So I guess all of those things become into the tactical evolution um, of, of what I see on the ice. I, I, I like, I like the way the game is gone. Um, I, I like, I almost, I almost like all of it. There, there's, I, I wish there was more. Um, I wish there was more in close play, but yeah. the game is spread out so much that so like you rarely see guys spinning off checks anymore. I, I used to find that really fascinating because it was a part of my game. Maybe that I'm in this tight spot. How do I get out of here? There's right. not many tight spots because you can't. If you get to a tight spot. And a guy spins on you. The only way to stop him is to put your stick out. Well, that's a hooking penalty now. Yeah. So, so you have to change the way you defend. I, but I, man, I love watching some of the goals the guys score today. I love what like. There's a guy nobody probably talks about much. Have you watched Miro Haskin in play? Like, oh my God, he's just an amazing yes, yeah. player. Yeah. Just Smooth, like eh? he covers the oh, ice yeah. like a gazelle. It's like yeah. nothing. And I'm like, man, I watch him play, and I'm like, yeah, we didn't have that. That wasn't no. there ten years ago. It just wasn't. Brian Leach, maybe, but there wasn't. There wasn't many. Well, let me ask you this: if if you were a coach in today's game, would would Michigan style goals make it into your <laughs> practice plan? Well, it wouldn't be in a practice plan, but if you can do it, do it. Like what? I here here's the thing. I'm going to give you three plays, and I want you guys to tell me the difference in all of them. Okay. Connor Bedard's um, Michigan play. Um, a kid for the Finns yesterday goes down the right wing, gets forced behind the net, wrap around scores. Right, wrap around. Yep. Brady Kachuk gets a breakaway in the Ottawa Senators game yesterday. Goes between his own legs and flips it up over the net. Aren't those all showy, selfish plays? No, it's bullshit. People are like this, this stuff about Bedard's Michigan play. That goalie made a heck of a save. Sure did. He's behind the goal line and he created a score, a legit scoring chance. What's he supposed to do? Chip it back in the corner and go cycle it again? He's well, got and, a and way to get the he's got a way to get the puck to a scoring area. And if the goalie doesn't keep himself upright, that's in. But Brady Kachuk had a breakaway and went through his legs. I don't have a problem with any of it because they're, if they can create a mismatch that gives them a chance to score, I don't find it selfish at all. I find it a guy trying to score. What about a guy taking a slap shot from the wing? That's pretty selfish. He could have, he could have passed it back to the D. Like I, the, honestly, I'm so frustrated the last couple of days just reading through Twitter and some of the guys that are writing it. I, Fans can, you know, they they get emotional about watching the team, and and I and I get all that. But they're saying, you know, you need to play Canadian hockey. What's that? Go keep running into the end boards. The game has evolved. It's evolved. It's different. These kids can do things that the old Canadian way couldn't, so they didn't. Exactly. The, the exactly. Ray, I just wanted to, I just wanted to throw in there because the the other one from that game was Fantilli and what a player he is mm -hmm. and and uh, um, he had he he made the similar play but the defender it wasn't the goalie who got that it was the defender actually yep. got a got a stick so so even how they defend you know now there's an awareness of this is a possibility whereas the first couple of times it happened everyone's just standing around right. kind of what happened right <laughs> now now there's actually a a a um, um, you know an action reaction right like the defender right. was totally aware of that this wasn't you know out of the blue it was I got to be prepared for a guy coming around that post it, okay where, so wherever the puck is <laughs> right wherever it is he's gonna yeah. he's gonna take it from it's not just necessarily gonna go up the boards back to the point this guy might try to take it from behind the net in here right. um, when I was still running uh, when Landon was coming up. Um, so my son Landon, who's now 31, he was like 12 and 13 at the time. And I was running summer skill stuff for their group of kids. Henrik Zetterberg used to do this move that nobody else really did very much. And he would come down the right side 
and he would slide the puck on the inside of the defenseman and work around the defenseman and shoot it from the other side. I, I thought it was the most creative thing. Or he'd go on the inside and lift the D's stick and shoot it all in one motion. Well, eventually the D learned to play that. And then Zetterberg had to come up with another move. There's always going to be a push to try and create some kind of mismatch to make a defender have to think and react. Because if you can get them to do that, maybe you got a chance to create the next action on the net. So what, what Bedard and Fantelli did, I, I honestly, I don't have a problem with it. I was on uh, post game last year at ESPN and I argued with John Tortorella for, I don't know how long. And I love torts. And we talked after I'm like, I hope that was okay. He's like, Oh, that was great. He mm-hmm. hated Zegras's pass over the back of the net right. that uh, uh, was it Milano yeah. scored Milano. Yeah. And, and I'm like, well, what difference does it make? It's, it's not, they're trying to win as much as old school guys are trying to win. They just got a different way of doing it. And so if what's the difference between Zegra standing behind the net and taking one step to his left, passing it out, and a guy shooting it in, or flipping it over the top of the net and Milano bunting it in. Now, if either play misses, now they got a back check. But the whole goal is to change the big numbers on the big clock. It's not to finish 0-0. Zero, zero. And if you can figure out a way to get to four, you're probably going to win. Well, you know, with that being said, Ray, so, I mean, I mean, you've, I think what's really unique about your career is that you've seemingly experienced the game through every possible lens, be it a player, <laughs> parent, you know, you've been on the ice coaching, obviously as an analyst. Um, if, if you were involved at the minor hockey level today, what would sort of encapsulate your, your philosophy or how you would, the sort of development experience you'd want to offer your, your players? My, my, my mantra, my foundation would be, my goal is to make your son or daughter better in April than they are in September. I'm not sure how many games we're going to win, but we'll be competitive. We will play with the puck as much as possible. I will try to teach as much awareness as possible. So when the puck comes to your kid, they can see what the next play is. Now we might turn the puck over because we're trying to make the next play and it's not the right play, but that's just fine. We also have a goalie wearing $8,000 worth of equipment back there. He's allowed to make a save. So I want my team to play with the puck, to learn, to read the play going as fast as you can. And my goal, my one goal will be to be better in April at the end of the year than we are in September at the start of the year. I mean, that's, that, that, that's a, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to use the word. It's a pretty simple approach, Ray. Like, and I, and I don't mean but that. Ian, don't you think, I mean, no, but don't but, you, don't but you, isn't that, Ian, yeah, go ahead. Ian, don't you think that in almost everything, the more complicated something becomes, the less likely it is to be completed. Oh. I, I do. I like, do. Like, what, what I'm saying is we, I, I'm saying every coach, no. I'm saying every coach should, should have just, uh, should, should write down what you just said. And there's their, there's their, uh, preseason, uh, parent meeting, quite honestly. Like, like I'm, I'm well, saying simple is good in this case because, because, um, I, I think more than anything, it, it allows everybody to understand, you know, one, where we're going, but, and, and two, you know, what, what the approach is going to be, not just strictly based on the standings, right? Like, I mean, that's, that's where things get out of hand because if it's now it's, it's the end of October or, or we're here, we're here at our kind of halfway point. We're here at our Christmas point. And uh, if, if, if the, if, if everything is based, if success is based on what the standings say and your standings aren't great, you know, your, your win loss record isn't great what kind of atmosphere is there for the rest of the year? Right. No, I'm, I believe me. I'm, I, I'm just, I, you know, when I, for, for me, it's minor hockey coaches take note. That's what I'm saying. Well, here's, here's another thing. I, I often wonder, you know, as the kids start to, you know, you know, the, the level of play starts to rise and the, the tournaments and things become more competitive and all that. Even at that point, why are we spending so much time teaching systematic hockey to the players? You can teach 
These kids are smart. You can teach them with a set of salt shakers how to play a system in two weeks. And then you put them on the ice, and each time they screw up the system, we now have video everywhere. Show them on the video, like, okay, you're outside here. Two steps in, you could be here. Like, for example, the uh, I'll use the the goal against uh, Canada, because I'm sure most people saw the game, but um, the Czech defender came in uh, and Fantilli was covering the point and he knew the defenseman was there, but the guy got inside him and and pushed it in the back door. It's a beautiful play. Now, if that's minor hockey, right? If it's not the world junior tournament, but it's minor hockey, you could show that goal to the player because this is part of system and it's also part of teaching and coaching, show him the video and say, Hey Adam, if you were back one stride towards the sideboards, that defenseman has to go in front of you. You'll see it every time, but because you were inside, he went on your back. You didn't catch him in time, but that's video. That's coaching. We can show the players this. I want my players over the course of the year to be able to do things more more skillfully, quicker, and more consistently. But if you're spending half the practice or a third of the practice working on systematic defensive zone coverage, you're wasting your ice time. That stuff can be done in a, in my opinion, in a mm-hmm. far tighter off the ice session. And even if you scramble around a bit in your zone, you can still coach it. You can still teach it. Now you have, the players all have an idea. They all watch TV. They all watch the games. They all want, they can see where they're supposed to be. You give them some early guidance, let them play, give them some more guidance, let them play, let them make mistakes, teach them out of their mistakes. Mm-hmm. If they never make a mistake, what are you doing as a coach? What, what are you coaching? If they never have the freedom to make mistakes, what are you doing? You're just standing there with a team jacket on behind the bench, changing the lines. Coach, help, support. They screw up, teach them so they don't do it again. And if they do it again, teach them again. That's the whole point of minor hockey. It, it, in Not minor hockey. That's the whole point of minor sport. sport yeah. Teach, support. When they make a mistake, give them guidance so they can learn it. That That's the only way. That we do it with math. Why don't we do it with sport? Well, I, I, th- I think going back to your comment, Ray, about, you know, how you, the outlook for the year, I just imagine that, you know, if you get all the adults involved in the same room and, and you give that speech, like all of the, the temperature just drops for everybody. Right. And then now people might actually be able to enjoy the game, but I want to go back to your salt shaker comment. So one of the most influential conversations and I mean this sincerely in my life not only as a coach but especially now as as, as a parent uh, with boys in sport so um, I coached Matt your oldest boy as a goaltender in Castlegar and I think at that time you probably came up to Castlegar I don't know one, once a month and I, I can recall I don't know if there was texting available at the time but I can recall um, you, you'd reached out and said hey do, do you want to meet up at a diner for breakfast the next morning and I said, sure. And so I, I go out and there's some small talk. And then you, you made a comment. You said, hey, um, I, I saw some things in the game last night. And if you'd like, I, I could sort of share my thoughts with it. And I said, okay. And so, you know, next thing you know, your table's cleared and the, you know, the the sugar packets are on the power play mm. against the peanut butter and jam packets. I think the maple syrup <laughs> might have been in that. And, um, and, and it wasn't like, it wasn't a do this or you're doing it wrong thing. It was like, Hey, here, here's some things that you can consider. And, and I can distinctly remember leaving that conversation and and running out to my car and I, gosh, I would have been in my early twenties at the time. And I, and I wanted to write it down. So I remembered it. And the only thing I had to scribble it down on was an old parking ticket, but I scribbled it down. <laughs> and I walked into practice that day and I'm like, boys, I got, I got the, the winning ticket here. <laughs> but my point is, is that, you know, given given the circumstance, it would have been really easy for you to come in. I think like a lot of parents do and say, you're doing it wrong. You should do it this way, or I'm going to huddle all the parents together in one corner of the rink. And we're just going to gripe about how something's not working on the ice versus saying, Hey, like 
all the adults should be together on the same team. And again, it's really, it's really influenced me and in just how I approach, you know, my, my own kids sporting experience, but, you know, given your background, obviously your wife, Cammie, you guys have two boys. How have you looked at that sort of parent coach relationship and how you help navigate your boys through their, their own sporting experience? Um, well, thanks. I'm, I'm glad we didn't lose all the salt shakers because <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, we still needed to eat. Um, yeah. It, I will say this, um, watching your child play um, is one of the more emotional things a parent, oh, emotionally man. connective things a parent can do. Because really, we just want our son or daughter to do the best they can, to enjoy it, to be the best player they can, to play at the highest level they can, basically to maximize their potential while they're having a great time. I mean, that's, that's kind of the, the scope of it in the way of it are all these obstacles. And it's pretty hard to have an exposed nerve when it's your kid, when it's somebody else's, you can say, Oh, you just have to be patient. Yes. That's easy. Yes. <laughs> when it's yours, so true, yeah. it's, it is just not easy no. at all. So if, if you want to coach coach, if not, you can't undermine the coach to anybody else and or to your son or daughter because they're going to have less acceptance of the coach's message. They're going to take – you might not like the coach. I can guarantee you he's got good things to teach. He or she has got good things to teach. Guarantee it. You might not like their method or you might not like that they favor your – friend's kid over your kid on the power play. You might not like that. Mm. And and that's all fair, but you can't be diving into coach unless you want to coach too many, you know, the old, too many cooks in the kitchen. All it does is confuse the whole thing. You lose the plot about what's trying to go on. So what Cammie and I do, we've had <clears throat> with both our boys, um, as it turns out, neither of them play hockey. Reese is 13, Riley's 16. They both play hockey or they both play soccer rather. And we've talked to coaches um, more for information. So we understand what their plan is with Riley and Reese. That's it. I, I wouldn't dream of telling a coach who's played his whole life and I haven't, I wouldn't dream of telling him how to employ my son on the soccer field. We, uh, Riley's the older one. He plays with Henrik Sedin's son. Hmm. Henrik at one point had to decide, this is how good a soccer player Henrik was, to decide him and Daniel whether to play soccer or hockey. They no chose way. hockey. Wow. Just think of that. At 15 or 16, they were that good. Henrik watches the game. He doesn't say a word. Hmm. Nothing. He'll say, oh, nice ball, good pass, good luck. That's it. He's not telling the coach where Walter should play on the field. No chance. And he would be qualified to do so. So the parent that gets so emotionally involved that they can only see the small picture <clears throat> is really losing the plot. And I'm not saying it's easy no. because I know it's not. I went through it with Matt. When Matt was playing for you, I hated every one of your defensemen because they could never clear the – he couldn't see the puck. There were too many rebounds or whatever it was, right? I, and yeah. then was, wasn't the watching, coaching. Wasn't <laughs> the coaching. Yeah, no, yeah. I'm like, he's defensemen. He's, yeah, yada, yada, yada. Yeah, and yeah, then when yeah. I'm watching Landon, it's like, oh, he was open. Why didn't the puck come back? Why yeah. – you know, like everything revolves around your child. And, and here's the thing. At the end of it, if you can just take a half a step back, say you've come home from the game and he's had, he or she's had a particularly bad night. After they go to do their thing, just sit down for five minutes and, and kind of take stock and go, was that really the end of the world? Or was that one bad day? And if it is a bad day, name me the player that's had a hundred good days in a row. Yeah, the answer is so nobody. So well said, yeah. You just, you just can't, it just, it just doesn't happen that way. No, well said. 
Well, Ray, I, I, I mean, one, one thing you, you, you touched on there and, and it's, it's, um, um, it, it, this gets more into kind of the, the development pathway and that's, you know, you, you mentioned, um, you know, Henrik Sedin choosing between football and, and, and hockey at, at the age of 15, you know, I, I know you're a baseball guy too. You know, I played soccer in the mm-hmm. summer, played hockey in the winter, you know, all th- right through high school. Right. Um, are, is there, is there, a this need to specialize, is it, is, is it, is it, you know, is it hurting that athlete overall? Because, because certainly out in, you know, I, I, I'm sure you guys are seeing in BC, certainly in Ontario. Um, and, and it's, and, and it's not just um, people playing hockey year round, you know, it, it could be people playing soccer year round, quite honestly. Um, mm-hmm. It could be, is, is that, you know, is this, is this going all in early? Is that hurting our, our sport as well? Or maybe, maybe say this a different way. Is it hurting our kids? Um from either, you know, um, putting all their eggs in one basket, I guess. And, and, you know, the parents putting all their eggs in one basket, quite honestly. Well, okay. So I, I do have a thought on that. Yeah. And that's if, if you're, if you're willing to get your son or daughter extra skating, mm. extra puck handling, extra skill work, your only expectation is that you should get your child to that session on time and that they should give you their best effort. If they, A, if they don't want to give you their best effort at that skill session, then why are you sending them there? If they don't want to do it, but you think they should, how is that helpful? You're just standing there on the side of the rink. They have to put the work in. They have to take the time out of their day. It might not be their love. Mm. And that's okay too. Your parenting's funny. Uh, you know, I've got four, right? Age 34 to 13. Right. And I would go back and do lots of things different. Like I, I know I became a better parent as I've become older. A lot of it through experience but a lot of it with Cammy and the way that Cammy views things. I, I used to have this saying, I'd say to her, look, I've already done this for 18 years. Didn't mean I was doing it right. And so I've, I've learned, I've learned it just a, of the many things I've learned from Cammy, parenting is, is, is one of them. Um, when you specialize in a sport, I think that's fine. I, I really do because there is, Nowadays, there is unlike when I grew up, mm-hmm. I just played baseball and I put my gear in the basement. Yeah, and then I picked it up in late August and tried it on in case my feet grew. Right, That's like right. that was basically it. Yeah, but there wasn't really it wasn't cost prohibitive. Mm. Now I understand where it becomes cost prohibitive. It becomes time prohibitive too. Right, you can't teams players are practicing more. So you might not have time to go to baseball practice and hockey practice because they might be on the same day. Like there's, that's a real thing. If, if you're specializing as we're calling it, like just focusing on one sport, the, the child doesn't owe you anything. They owe their best effort. And if it's not their best effort, then maybe you need to find something else, but you can't, you cannot say to your child, we're getting extra skating, we're getting extra uh, skill work, and you're not putting an effort in, and I'm taking you there, who cares? Yeah, I'm, if you're taking I'm pay- them there, I'm that's paying, up to you. Right, that comes up. Yeah, um, you, you don't, all, all you deserve out of that right. is their best effort. And again, I'll say it again, and if you can't get their best effort, that maybe that is a deeper discussion that they just don't want to give it. They might love the sport, they just might might not want to put the work in to get to a level you want them to get at. Their sport might be about hanging out with their friends. Right. They love the game. They'll they'll work at it to a certain level, and then they're like, "Yeah, you know what? I kind of like the teamwork stuff as opposed to all the extra individual work." It's hard for you to swallow, but that's just the way it is. 
they're not you. Well, just on on Ian's comment, I, we had uh, Ken Martell, who's the technical director for USA Hockey, on on, on my podcast <clears throat> last week, and he I, I've looked all over the internet for this. I haven't found it, but he referenced a study that the NHLPA did. I believe it was last year. And they went through their membership. And one of the questions they asked them was, you know, did you play other sports growing up? And they wanted to just to get, I think, a a, a feel for how these players were developed and some best practices. And and I'm going to get the numbers a little bit mixed up. But I I recall was that up to 14, over 80% Mm -hmm. of NHL players had played multiple sports. And when they stretched that to 16, it was still in the 70s. Um, regardless, and, now, and mm. I, I don't know if that's, you know, being hyper competitive, mm. that might be they're into golf or they play some recreational baseball, but there was still that element where these kids were, if I were to guess, they were just really, they just like competing, whether it was at right. probably checkers or, you know, with their buddies at, you know, wh- yeah. whatever, basketball. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you both though, Ray, is, you know, you grew up in trail. I spent time there coaching and, and for anybody that hasn't been there, like it, it's like, if they were to do a Disney movie on like you sports. If they were to do like Friday night lights and hockey, like trail might be the the perfect location to do that. And, and one thing that really stood out to me when I was there is that there was so many people in the community who I'm assuming never got an honorarium. Like they probably didn't even get gas money, but it had been you sports coaches for, for generations. And, and, you know, they might as well have had statues when they were, you were rolling into town. Like they were, they're very much revered. You know, just based on your experience as a young man growing up and, and, and playing sports, like what would you sort of describe kind of the, the or if you were to paint a picture of, of uh, the optimal youth sports coach, what are some of those characteristics that they might have, you know, aside from the, you know, the skill development part, but just in terms of how they, they handle kids? Um, well, it's certainly it's changed too, right, Aaron? I mean, yeah. like, um, but I, I played in the Little League World Series in 1976. No way. Yeah, my little brother wow. Tony played in 1981. Trails had five entries uh, in the Little League World Series, wow. and, and we're talking like 15,000 people. Is that stretching it? Like it's a small town. What to? Uh, oh, the town. Oh, that's stretching it. Yeah. Okay. The year, yeah, like the year we went to the the year we went to the World Series in '76, we had 19 kids try out for the team. 14 <laughs> made it. So we wow. had a coach who coached from the late '60s. Uh, up until, oh gosh, I, I won't have the year right, but late 90s, um, Andy Bolesky was his name. Andy was a legend. Andy was disciplined. Um, Andy was knowledgeable. And he could get, I think this more than, as I think about coaching, I think this is, there's two points that really are, are critically important critically important. And one is the coach has to show that he cares, that he, that he cares for the player, that I want you to be the best player you can be. And the second part is no matter how smart they are, they have a way to communicate to the player what their idea is. You could be the two smartest coaches ever. And if I don't know what the hell you're talking about, because you can't make it my language so that I can absorb it. You're just two really smart guys. (laughs) It doesn't matter. And so the, like we were lucky in, in trail, um, you know, like with Andy was when, when there was a situation on the field and you know, baseball is far different. It's start and stop. It's very static. And, but when something happens in a baseball game, it happens fast. And, you need to know if the ball's hit to you, you can't even really think. You've got to know where the ball is supposed to go. We were 11 and 12. We were so prepared because Andy was able to teach us about what the next play is. I'm, I'm a big believer. I said it earlier. I'm a, when you asked about the foundation for my coaching, if I were, I'm a big believer in the best players know where the next play is. Not the play that's going on. They know where the next play is. Yeah, they're able to, they're able to scan, to learn where everybody is, take a, a picture, like a you know, like a just a quick snapshot, 
and the puck comes to them and they know where it has to go. You know, I, I don't know if you guys are soccer fans, but we just, you know, we're big in this house, of course, and we just watch yeah. Messi and like everybody else that seemed to tune in. And when the ball comes to him, to me, what I see is I, see, I know he sees the future. He sees the next play. And that is, if you can help teach kids, okay, you're going to get the puck. Let's use this. A breakout pass comes to you. You're the, you're the centerman. You get it down nice and low. You should have the awareness to know, okay, the four checker's coming from my left. He won't be coming from my right because I'm swinging right. He's not going to be standing there. Yeah. So you're starting to paint a picture. So where's the open ice? If I don't have room to skate, what if I stop? That means the whole far side's open. But of course, that happens in a second. So why can't we take less time structurally and systematically and start teaching the next play? I, I think, I don't say it's easy. I never think this stuff is easy, but I think it's possible. And I think it's really beneficial to the player. I, uh, Ray, I, I am actually a big football fan, as I tell Aaron all the time. Um, and, yeah. and we, we talk about how hockey's evolved. Well, we, we just saw the World Cup take place where, you know, people were calling it the best ever, right? The, the skill of the players, right. the execution. And, but, but I, I, you know, your one comment, when I hear the word scan, I think of soccer, football, not hockey. And, and, and I, one, I just don't think the term gets used a lot, but, but I, I, as soon as you say it, I'm thinking, you know, Messi has, has, has looked, you know, identified space where he's going to attack next. Just like you just said, I, I think I, I, we, we often in hockey, the equivalent is, you know, head on a swivel, but I always think of that as a defensive skill, not a, not a potentially mm-hmm. an offensive skill. Like, like, so, so that alone, there's something, you, you know, you can teach on ice. You can teach you, you spoke about your salt shakers. You can teach off ice. We, I, I think, is, is that not the next, like where this kind of, you know, goes that, that we can, we can translate well, I into think it has to. It's incredible. I, th- I think it has to, Ian, because the game goes so fast. Yeah. If you don't know where the next play is, how are you going to make it? So I'll, I'll give you a couple of players here yeah. um, that I think scan the ice um, at an elite, elite rate. Two of them are retired. Okay. One of them, of course, is the greatest player ever. That's Wayne Gretzky. Sure. How many times I played against him? He'd get the puck. He'd pass it to nobody. Oh, here comes Yari Curry. Yeah. Where the hell did he come <laughs> That's from? Right. But Gretz knew where everybody was. The second I played with for seven years was Ron Francis. <laughs> Ron knew where everybody was, and he knew where the open space was. Right. He just, he just knew it. Um, current players, uh, David Krejci in Boston, he's been too slow for 15 years. Right. Guy's an amazing player because the puck comes to him and he knows where it's going next. He just, the puck comes, it's whether it's to his backhand or his forehand. And of course he's got the skill to make the play, but he sees it. Another is Nick Suzuki in Montreal. Mm, yeah. I think that kid is so smart. He's I don't know when his first moment of panic is going to be, but it hasn't happened yet. Like he just gets it and he just looks like he's, he's confident. He knows where everybody is. He lays off a, you know, think of the plays he makes. Like he lays off these passes to Cole Caulfield on the, on the power play. And Caulfield's smart enough to find where the passing lane is. He moves, but Suzuki's looking to his right and he passes it to his left because he can see the next play. I think that scanning of the ice can be taught. Yeah. And one of the ways it can be taught is in small area games, not a small area two on two, a small area three on three or four on four. Right. So it's crowded. So that it's yeah. hard. And you have to you have to be quick, but you have to know where everybody is, or else you're hitting everybody in the shin pads with your pass. That that is that is a superpower if a player has the scanning ability to know where people are on the ice. The, the, I, I, the, the, 
I mean, when we talk about the skill of the players and we're talking about, you know, again, we talked about the mixture again, we talked about the, 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 the ability to, you know, the ride edges and all that, that technical skill. I mean, it's just gone up and up and up, but, but that superpower you're talking about, I mean, that's, that's a, 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 you know, a, a mental skill, uh, um, an awareness skill. So I, I love when you say you can teach that because that's the whole, the old thing, you know, hockey IQ, right? Like you just got it, right? Some guys just have it. That's no, not good some, enough, some right? Do. No, but, but, but some guys do, but they've got it at such an elite sure, level. Sure. It makes you think that nobody else can learn. Look, not everybody is going to be Ron Francis or Wayne Gretzky, but why couldn't they be me? You know, like I was a pretty good player, sure. but I certainly couldn't scan and see like those guys, but I played for 18 years. So to think it can't be learned right. is, is 100% false. Not everybody's going to learn it at an elite level, but people can learn to play their sport because it's, they're doing it all the time through repetition. You're going to learn patterns. If you pay attention, right. I, I think it's, <clears throat> I do think it is um, with the speed of the game, it will be a separator. Now, uh, between good players and great players, okay players and good players. I did the Stanley Cup finals last year. <clears throat> there was, I'm going to say five plays, but that's just a, a number where Kale McCarr looked like he was on another play. Oh, yeah. Like the, like, the, the play would get dumped into his corner. There's nowhere to go. And all of a sudden he escapes and he's skating up the ice. And you're like, he was like Houdini. Yeah. How did he get one, out of there? One man breakout. And, and yeah. that wasn't, yeah, but that wasn't, that wasn't vision. That wasn't scanning. That was flat out athletic ability. Mm. And he's got it at another level that other people can't learn. But you can learn to scan the game. You can learn to be better on your edges. So why can't you be better? at learning how to see the game, how to think the game. I know you can, but it takes time and repetition. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Ray, um, Ray, this is this has been great and I think so insightful for yeah. our listeners. And you know, over the course of this conversation, we've obviously talked hockey, um, talked a little football or soccer, talked about baseball. I know you're a big golf guy. Uh, as we wrap here, if I had a, a magic wand, and, and I could grant you a wish to go see any sporting event on the planet, one that you haven't seen before, because I know you spend a lot of time in rinks. Where, where are you going? What are you checking out? Mm. I can only, how big is your magic wand? Can I have three? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, you got it. You got it. You got it. We got to narrow it zero down to one. Gabby um, says you only get one. I would say... It, this is a real toss-up, but it's either the Masters um, or or the World Cup. Yeah. If I could sit on the 16th green <laughs> at the Masters, I think I think I would All be really. Days. <laughs> well, I would move around, but I'd leave my chair there just in case <laughs> yeah, I could yeah. come back. <laughs> and then just watching, like watching the World Cup uh, this past month, like just the emotion of the countries and their fans yeah. and to be in that stadium. I mean, I, I think that would just be, that would be something you would never ever forget. Yeah, I can't, I can't even, my, my oldest boy is down in South America right now. I was in Argentina when they won and just, oh, they, uh, I, I, I don't, I don't know if he slept yet. <laughs> like I think he's still enjoying it. So how, how about speaking of fanatics and fans and, Messi's driving up to his house. Did you see the crowd outside his house? Yeah. No. If you're him, I saw like the, him, I saw like the parade. It was bananas. But yeah. If you're him, I I don't know that I want that many people knowing where I live. No. <laughs> I, if I'm Messi, I live in Oakville. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! I saw. I, yeah. I mean, he just, he just yeah, said. he couldn't get out of his house, right? Like he was pretty much yeah bunkered bunkered down. It was, it was one. It was one of the most incredible things, though. I just. I love that tournament. I love watching him play. Um, I think we are incredibly fortunate to have watched their careers. Like 
Ronaldo to mm-hmm. but Messi to me is just at a, he's at another level for me. And I just, I, I love that I've been able to watch and, and learn the game watching him. We actually saw him, Cammy and I and Reese and Riley, uh, they had a Copa qualifying event in Chicago and we were there visiting Cammy's parents. We sat, I'm not even kidding, in the last row of Soldier Field. No kidding. If you want a workout, walk to the top of that <laughs> stadium. So we get to the top, and he's not even playing because he had a bit of a back issue. And But now we see, I've never seen a stadium, guys, with more of one jersey. Right. Messi Argentina, Messi Barca, all these different number 10 jerseys all over Start of the second half, he's warming up, and it was down at the end zone. And they kept showing him on the clock, on the big board. And the place would go crazy. And he was just trudging around, warming up. And then we notice him walking around the end zone, back to the bench. And he's taken off his practice kit. We're like, oh, my God, he's going in. So he went in, 27 minutes, scored three goals. And Cammy and I were high-fiving like children. We were so... It, and back to the scanning thing, 15 minutes of the, tw- nah, 20 minutes of the 27, he was walking he around, yeah, just looking around. Yeah. And then he got the ball and he went zip, 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 scored. Then he scored on a free kick. Then he scored on a penalty. It was one of the great moments that I've ever seen watching that brilliance. Wow. It was amazing. Well, I'll tell you what, that's, that's a great way to, to close it out. And, and Ray, uh, I'll tell you what, again, really appreciate your time. And I think I speak on behalf of all Canadian hockey fans. We miss hearing your voice in our living rooms at this time of year, but uh, also glad you're getting to spend it with family. And um, again, thanks so much for sharing your insights with us and uh, best of luck the rest of the season. Thanks guys. It was, uh, it was fun to come on. And uh, that tournament was a big part of my world junior tournament. It was a big part of my life for a dozen years. Um, it's time to be home. And so I am, uh, I am really happy where I am that I'm watching. So <laughs> I watch, you know, I watch them go through it now and know that, oh my God, they got two games today and two games tomorrow right. and two day, two games a day. And, after. The, couch, and the couch is getting a workout. <laughs> it, it is. Be. It is. Yeah. Take care. Happy new year guys. Likewise. You bet. Thanks Ray.